from BC3 for eight years, but I am living in, I'm living in Oklahoma. Um, Oklahoma is a state that would surprise you. Um, I've said that they have a big population of early childhood education, and it's supported, but Oklahoma has growing and surging, uh, surging populations all throughout the state, especially around the Tulsa area and in, in those school districts that are there. One of the things that happens is there's not enough space and there's not enough materials for kids. And when we restructured elementary school there, you had fourth graders sitting in, sitting in chairs that were for first and second graders. I'm barely 5'5", five five, I weigh about 145 pounds. Um, I know some fourth graders that are kind of about the same height as me, and that's kind of a problem. Um, and if I gave them a bad physical environment where they couldn't be comfortable, that's going to cause them to have challenging behavior and be aggressive. How would you like to be a child that had to sit in a chair that you didn't fit in for eight hours? It would stink. Um, so try to find ways to make your classroom better for every child. Um, and if you can find a way to change a behavior that helps, that works. Um, one of the things that I hate is the whole semicircle arrangement. Um, I normally just record lessons. You know, let, me, let, me, let me switch this up a little bit today. Um, because you might have this on the PECT exam as well. I'm going to move my camera around. And I'm going to put it over here. Hopefully you can see the board. Our beautiful labs in this glorious state. Um, so I, on the board right here, I got kind of a little bit of space here. Um, when I go into a classroom, um, remember I'm observing the principals, not the teachers anymore, but when I used to observe the teachers, um, arrangements I hate. You want problems in your classroom, this is number one arrangement that will cause you problems in your classroom. Because at some point, unless you are a crazy person who's running around in a circle, the back is always going to be, your back is always going to be to somebody. And that's a contextual fact factor that you can fix as a teacher. You never want your back to a child. I will say one thing about this environment that I've mentioned that it's actually pretty helpful. For tests, this is pretty good. Because you can walk around and you can see what the kids are doing, you can be behind the kids, it might cause them a little bit of pressure, but you know, think about it, you know, child here, I'm behind them, I'm also my eyes on this child as well. Um, I'm a big fan of tables, even up through fourth grade, I mean, I'm a fan of it in middle school too. Um, I like the idea of this, I think it promotes group work, but as I've said before, try to switch the kids around frequently, it's a good idea. Um, think about college classrooms. You know, if, if you're taking classes in, in Cranberry, you're taking classes in, in, in Lawrence Crossing, you're in these tables. You know, you're going to be in tables where you're sitting three to a table. So knowing that, I mean, what's wrong with getting a kid ready for that, you know, when it comes time for, um, when it comes time for them to, you know, go to college? Um, just to even prove it to you right now. Look at, look, look at the room we're in right now. Um, it's, it's a college classroom where they're learning and uh, it's common so when you have an environment like that um, and watch this video is going to be off because I moved it but that's okay um, when you have an environment like that you know why can't we keep that going um, to cause a good factor in the classroom in, 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 an, early, um, in an early age with kids um, you create the classroom environment you screw up the classroom environment it's your fault you do, not cre you do not create the child's whole self in their, ch in their child environment. You create the classroom environment. Don't mess that one up. The other ones you don't have as much autonomy over as you want to think you do. This one you do, don't screw it up. So um, you need to reflect on what you do right and you need to reflect on what you do wrong. Um, try to do stuff um, that you know, if, if you see that something doesn't work and you think you can change it and make it better, that's perfectly acceptable um, and you can change practices all the time and to find ways to better your teaching and, 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 better, and, and, and better your ability. Um, I, taught a class, uh, I, I, I taught a class online last term um, and I, I had some issues with it, to be honest with you. Um, I, one of the things that I did is where we were doing web marketing, I teach business courses too, um, and I was, um, I had them do a project where I had them go to electronic sites and write about what they saw. And I got an email from somebody that said, that's kind of gender bias. And I thought about it, and I don't see it as gender bias, I guess, but 
took time to reflect and I said, okay, I get it now. So what I've done now is I've given options. I've said go to a retailer store and I've given a list of about 20 different things. And I made sure there was Bed Bath & Beyond on there, um, Best Buy, uh, Radio Shack, Express, I, I, think, I think Macy's is on the list now. I, I won't teach it again for another six months, but I realized that I put my students in a bad position by creating a project that some have no interest in, nor do they care about. If you give a multitude of options, I fixed it, and I reflected on it, and I'm gonna change my practice. Nothing wrong with doing something in changing it. This is why on your lesson plans that you're gonna have to make, and trust me, if you continue on, you're gonna have to write these long, lengthy lesson plans, you, you know, a year in, you're gonna say, I know how to do all this stuff, why am I still doing it? What I care most about when I supervised, teacher, when I supervised te teachers was that reflection component. What did you learn from this? What did you take away from this? What can you do better and more effectively as an educator now the next time you teach this lesson? If smart teachers do something right and then they save it. If you do, you know, I'm, I'm ranting, but it's important that I rant right now because this is it. I mean, I only got a couple more chapters with you guys. Um, but if I can harp one thing on, you know, my, my 16 years in education, um, if you do everything right the first time and you don't just stumble through, it makes your life so much easier that, that this can be routine year after year after year after year after year. Um, I've taught basic human resources now 25 different times at the college level for undergrads. I know what questions are going to be asked. I know what projects I'm doing. I know how to grade them. Um, I do no prep work for that class. This class I changed some of these PowerPoints. There, there's 13 in here, and reflecting back on it, um, from the last time I taught this class, I went through and I changed five of them. I can eight the same, but I changed five of them because I needed to update them because education changes. Human resources changes, but not as much updating as I needed to do for this class. And as you learn something and you do it right and you see what works and you see what doesn't work and you see what projects work well with kids, it's going to make you a more effective teacher. It's why good principals keep people in the same grade levels if they can, as long as they're performing successfully. So just, you know, loose me is two cents on, on this. So, right here, this is an example that's in the book. Children arrive at 8.15 a.m. and they do worksheet after worksheet. Um, they have difficulty paying attention, they're squirming, the teacher tells them to pay attention. This is awful. This is horrible, 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 horrible. Um, why would the teacher be giving them a worksheet? Well, what if it's staggered attendance? What if they're coming in different hours in the morning, waiting for the buses to get there, keeps them going, keeps them doing something? I get that. But um, first grade children should not be spending their days doing worksheets. Um, you need to get them active, you need to get them moving. Um, Good teachers might be quizzing them as the day goes on, engaging them in conversation. Once everybody shows up, bring them to the center, make sure that everybody knows that they're there, get everybody together. That's a good and that's an effective day. So here we go with this. And I, I mention this because this is the rest of the book and it is the rest of everything that we cover in this class. It's this decision-making model of child guidance. This is intentional decisions that you make when you interact with children, during discipline, without discipline, um, but you need to make sure that you do it appro developmentally appropriately. Um, think about the situations you have to handle, understand family context, different backgrounds, um, and try to find ways that you, know, you can fix it. So parents understand child's development, but some, some, aren't, ab you know, some aren't able to meet the needs that a child has. Um, but they still understand what child development is. You can be book smart, you can read to your child, but you might not know, you know a challenge that a child is going to have um, midway through the day. And it might not be something you can help them with. Um, it really comes from parents and their own parents. Um, and some, it actually inspires them to be better parents. So here's our model again. Um, I started off the lecture with observe, decide, take action, and reflect. Um, this is the model, this is what you should be doing, um, and it's certainly what we're going to be looking for um, in, you know, in, in, in the end procedures for this class. So we're going to look at some scenarios. We're going to talk about biting first. So when you observe children biting, children are likely to bite because they are angry or they are afraid. It is important to you to try to figure out what it is. 
if you alarm a child when they're biting somebody, what could happen? And if you're thinking in your head, they might bite harder, then you got a bigger problem on your hands because that is what could happen. Um, it's important to know if they're angry or afraid because angry, it's aggression, afraid, they're defending themselves. So observe, see what's going on. Try to get both sides of the stories. Decide if it was developmental or um, it was you know, an unmet need. Um, sometimes infants and toddlers, if we're talking about that age group, they bite by exploring mouthing and chewing. They'll just start biting things. Um, while the smart board looks good, I'm going to just jump in there and take a bite out of it. Um, or they'll do it because they don't get, they get an unmet need. Some kids will learn right away. If I bite, I have control. Um, but they have to be taught how to get what they want in a healthy way. But it's difficult sometimes to tell the difference between what a developmental issue is and an unmet need. So take action. Um, maybe, you know, if they're teething, give them a clean cloth or a teething ring to bite. Um, if they're just antsy, sometimes giving somebody a stretch band or rubber band can help too. Um, if it's an attention issue, meaning they want attention, that's good because if you can spend time with them, you can fix it. Um, you got to teach a new behavior though. You got to show them that it's not acceptable. Um, and if you can do that, that's going to be the most effective way to do it. Because so then you'd reflect, take a look, see if your decision helped the child. Were you calm about it? If you've gone angry, you can fix it. Were you kind but firm? Is there anything you could have done differently? That's something that you have to do when you're looking at this model. So next is teasing. Um, we'll really only talk about the observe model here um, because related to the aggression chapter that you just covered, think about you know what would happen. Um, do you do anything that would be considered teasing to a child? If so, you know, is that a problem? Does the child know when you're teasing them? Is it playful teasing? Um, is it not playful teasing? Um, I'll give you an example here. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in a different state. I lived in Pennsylvania for how many years? Um, and I have a colleague down the hall who I absolutely love. And every day he knocks on my door and he says, you need to start coming to work more. And he does it as a joke because I'm always here. I, I come to the office pretty much every day in a routine. It's what I like to do. I was I said I work with elementary kids, routine, routine, routine. So I come into the office every day. Um, that could be teasing to me as an adult because what if I had problems in my last job? What if I didn't come in? What if um, I'm making other people look bad by coming in? And I've actually been told that. Um, so is that something I say something about? You know, does a child like it if you call them a different name? Um, Stay calm and centered. Um, you're trying to give them a way to better accomplish whatever goal um, they're trying to accomplish. Um, you want them to not do it. You want them to understand what the problem is. And then look at who they're picking and why they're picking them, because that can say a lot. And then you can intervene yourself. So on your own, think about ways that you can decide, take action, reflect on this. Um, I put you into groups in class, but you know, obviously, we're not doing that. So. The next few chapters are going to be so quick. Um, we're going to just really talk about the model. Um, you're going to go through them a lot quicker than you did these last two chapters. These are long ones. Um, so we'll finish with those, um, in, and we'll talk about the applications. And really, just more than anything else, I want you to leave this class just thinking and reflecting about ways that you can help children socially and emotionally. Um, my big thing was always socially more than emotionally. but. This chapter, this book is more emotional than social, but they're both equally important. So try to find ways that you, as the educator, can help kids in, in both aspects. Thank you.